and we are live he says with hesitation and interpretation as always welcome to this um latest episode of totally unscripted um so in a change to uh the scheduled program we've got something slightly different unfortunately uh real notman who uh was going to join us today his his wife isn't well so we're on to plan b in terms of uh, a show but um we're hoping to um keep on topic so we're, we're, we've basically got uh, bits and pieces of um firebase uh, to talk about so uh, quite a few different news items that we'll, we'll just go through so um the first one of this um kind of falls on from uh the last show when we were speculating what what was happening with um new sites in terms of apis and um lo and behold google have um uh kind of given us a a, a, a ray of hope uh with this recent update um on to the um google apps uh, or now the google suite users so um the announcement was mainly about the fact that old sites was going to be deprecated and the process um, for moving across. But at the bottom of that post, there were um, uh, a number of features that aren't in new sites right now, but they said they would implement. And the bottom one is probably the most important for us uh, in the AppScript community is API abilities. So um, do, do we, <laughs> I, I take it we all welcome this news. <laughs> I, I know, Steve, this is an area that you've been quite interested in vocal on, so. Yes, because uh, I've heard some rumblings of people not having confidence in using Google Sites as an intranet for the business and enterprise level. And, and it's good to hear that this list is now out to say, here are some things that are coming down the roadmap. So it's encouraging to see this. Um, so there's no dates on this. Um, so um, I think it sounded like they would, we'd start seeing some things by the end of the year, um, but um, uh, positive progress. So moving on, next thing. So this is something that um, you picked up, uh, Steve, from yesterday that um, for uh, Google admins, uh, G Suite admins, uh, there is uh, a new console view that um, um, is showing activity um, based on AppScript and um, AppMaker if you're in the early access program. Steve or anyone else, have you been able to access this and see what level of reporting you get? Tested it yet, uh, no. Uh, well, based on uh, what we can see from the screenshot uh, for now, uh, it seems the uh, reports are pretty simple, but I will be interested to know exactly what we can get if we use the uh, download uh, icon we can see on the screenshots. Yeah. Uh, but if uh, we take a look at the um, um, at the announcement, uh, it says that uh, uh, the feature will launch uh, 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 through the next uh, days. So we should be able to test it uh, pretty quickly. So hopefully in the next um, show, we'll, we'll be able to um, perhaps just pull out some of the data that we can see from that so um it's been a while since we've had i think a big outage from app script but, but they do happen so um this was uh quite a recent one on the 2nd of may so andrew stillman um i think was the first one to uh, open the issue take out on this so there was an issue with the the json parse um uh, within add-ons um so um, I think, Steve, you were monitoring this one quite closely as well. How long does it take before the services were resumed? Um, it, it happened about 9 p.m. GMT time zone. It lasts about two to three hours. So depending on your user base, they were either affected during that time or they weren't. So hopefully not, not too bad. I know I had some users with my add-ons that were affected. Yeah, the, uh, well, optimistic side here is that uh, recently there was another uh, big issue affecting a lot of uh, add-ons uh, uh, scripts um, due to errors in the uh, properties 
service uh, in AppScript. And uh, it took, I think, at least uh, uh, eight or 10 hours uh, for Google to uh, wake up simply uh, and uh, uh, change uh, something in their system. And uh, after that, they say that uh, they will be more reactive in the future. And uh, in, indeed, uh, this uh, specific issue hasn't uh, uh, taken so long for Google to, um, uh, well, it was rolled back uh, uh, very, uh, very fast. And uh, I, I think it's good, if, even if uh, it would be even better if uh, uh, we don't have to suffer uh, such issues uh, if they are able to uh, respond quickly and uh, if we don't have to uh, wait for uh, one of the Googlers to uh, wake up because they are all working on the same time zone, uh, it, it is better. Yeah, just a, a comment. I, I think that I think we've had three outages on property services quite recently, uh, one of them involving cash as well. And, and I think that the in each case, it was the result of a change. Um, and I think the last one they had to, they rolled back the change quite quickly, which was, which was good. But, you know, property services is, is, uh, is vital to pretty much anybody who has got scripts that they share out. So, you know, I think that from certainly from my perspective, um, you know, we do need to keep reporting very quickly every time that we see a property service issue coming up. Um, number one, so that people can realize that this is something that's a big deal and not just a kind of a little thing. Um, and secondly, of course, so that we can get their attention rather quickly. Uh, you know, this, this this property service type thing is one of the, in my opinion, one of the worst things that can go wrong um, because it affects, from a scripting perspective, because it affects, you know, everybody. So let's keep up the pressure every time that we see um, anything like this and keep following up. Um, did you talk much on authentication flow, the new flow? No, we didn't. We were waiting for you to talk about that. <laughs> so now you can. So, um, previously, you just went, uh, users, when they were prompted, they just went into kind of a scope of authorization. Uh, they've still been reskinned, and there's a new step where users um, select the account um, they want to use. Um, so, I don't know if this is related to. Um, there was a, a quite publicized um, Google Docs phishing attack, um, which for once was not Google Apps Script <laughs> related. Um, Romain, do you want to talk a bit more to this? Uh, yes, uh, I thought it was interesting to, to mention that because uh, for me, something like that was uh, going to happen at some point. Uh, and, uh, well, the first thing is that uh, maybe in part uh, due to uh, app scripts and uh, uh, other tools using the uh, Google APIs, uh, people are, uh, uh, they are used to authorize uh, a lot of different applications. And uh, here, uh, this uh, specific, uh, app or email was uh, asking uh, access to your uh, world Gmail inbox uh, and uh, to your world Google Drive. Uh, and people uh, authorized that uh, without any issue, without, uh, uh, as, well, maybe they, they thought it was, uh, uh, maybe they wondered uh, why it was asking that, but they, they still, uh, granted the authorizations, and uh, uh, we've seen that uh, it has uh, spread um, very fast because um, every time uh, someone was uh, giving uh, access to his Gmail account, uh, this app was uh, getting access to uh, your contacts and was using the Gmail API uh, to send uh, the same emails to all your contacts, uh, so up to uh, 1,500 emails as, as it's the uh, daily uh, Gmail quota available. Uh, 
and uh, then all people were uh, recipients were also uh, giving the same access and so on and so on. And so in some domains where a lot of people uh, were receiving uh, this email from their colleagues, uh, it uh, spread like crazy because uh, each coworker was uh, accept accepting and then sending uh, the email to other coworkers and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and for me, this is yeah bound to happen again uh, because uh, people uh, continue to be uh, to uh, accept more, have to accept more and more uh, authorizations like that uh, every time they are using an add-on and uh, app on mobile and so on. And here, as they don't have to. Uh, give their password or anything. They just have to authorize the app to use their Gmail and Drive account. Uh, it's even, uh, uh, well, they, 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 they don't see any issue. Uh, people are uh, more um, responsible when uh, entering their password, uh, but when simply clicking on, in, on an authorized button, uh, they don't seem to care. And uh, it was interesting because uh, a lot of uh, uh, articles uh, from uh, tech blogs uh, on the web uh, say that uh, it was incredible because uh, the uh, authorization page really looked like a, a standard Google page. Uh, and it was even uh, from a Google.com URL and so on. But uh, yes, it was a real uh, Google page because it was uh, the uh, standard URL. Uh, used by Google to uh, ask uh, you to grant access to another app. Uh, and uh, so indeed, uh, because of all that, uh, people seem to uh, to trust uh, when they shouldn't. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I think if I was right trying to uh, work on a phishing attack like that it might have been way worse <laughs> and uh, uh, if other hackers are uh, uh, well want to do the same it, i don't think it will be difficult and i don't really see a solution um, for google about that so yeah i don't know if it will happen again but uh, for me there's no reason why it shouldn't so if anybody's been affected by this, then the way to do it is to go to your authorized apps and find this application and, and remove the authorization that you've given it. I imagine that everybody's would have done that by now, but just in case. And uh, no, you, well, in fact, you don't need to because, uh, well, Google had to do something about that. So uh, they shut down the app and so on. It, uh, the, uh, or authorization that were given were given to a specific uh, uh, console project on the cloud platform, uh, which have been shut down. Well, I think okay. there were several projects, but anyway, it's done. Fair enough. It is, it, it is worrying um, how, uh, you know, it was a big relief for me that this wasn't actually Google Apps Script behind this, because quite often it is. Um, so, I think it's going to increasingly create headaches um, for Google, um, but hopefully, as a consequence, they they don't close what you know things that we use down for App Script. But we just have to wait and see. So, at the top of the show, I, I mentioned that um, we wanted to do something around um, Firebase. So. Um, uh, this is, I think we're on plan G now with the number of technical issues we've had, but so how far we get through with this demo, I don't know, but, um, uh, no, no, we didn't do any demo, uh, honestly, we, we were waiting for you. <laughs> um, well, so we'll see how, so this is just, I, I, I put my hand up and say, I haven't really used Firebase until mm, this morning. Um, so this is very much um, my of you know just using Firebase 
Um, I did write something not too long ago about how you could use, based on something um, real ed actually produced on how you can use Firebase for uh, a logger. Um, but this this example is looking at how you can just simply uh, read and write data to Firebase. So first thing to highlight, Firebase is not just a database. There's a whole list of um, services. And um, in the, the show we do next time, we're going to do uh, cloud functions for Firebase. So that's another feature. Spencer Easton has done uh, cloud um, uh, Firebase hosting. So this is just another feature of Firebase. Um, so in terms of the database, it's uh, uh, if you come from um, or use script DB back in the day, which is now no longer with us, it, Firebase databases are the same sort of format. They're um, um, NoSQL uh, based, so they don't have a formal structure. Um, so there, it, you know, if you've got problems that fit that um, kind of uh, uh, gap, then uh, Firebase is, is worth looking at. In terms of my cribbing I did uh, this morning, um, I basically used Romain's got a wonderful tutorial on Firebase. So I just basically went through that. And I borrowed um, stuff from Bruce. So Bruce had a, um, uh, Bruce has been using um, an abstraction DB uh, service where you can plant in lots of different databases in. Um, so we'll share a link to the slides after the show so you can go through this uh, yourselves uh, to show you the process because um, there are some, with any interface, uh, it can be problematic sometimes finding where things are. Um, so I'm just going to um, uh, share my screen. So hopefully you can see. So this is just um, the Firebase um, uh, console. Um, so before we get started, we're, we're just going to create uh, a new project. So the quotas on Firebase are uh, very flexible. So um, I've got a slide at the end that's got these. So um, basically, they have a free program. So we're just going to, sorry, it helps if you click on the right screen. We're just going to create a, a project here. So the, the project name you give will, will basically be uh, form part of the um, the URLs that we use later on. So I'm just going to create a project. Um, so Firebase is going off and setting up everything that we need. And uh, uh, basically now the project's created. So you can see uh, immediately we've got all the other Firebase um, tools here. But the one we're interested in is the, the database. So in terms of what we want to do in next steps, um, now that we've created the, the database, is in this uh, demonstration, I'm just going to, um, I want to um, grab a couple of bits of information. So um, the first bit is the URL. So this is when you're um, making calls to the, to the Firebase, um, you, you include a URL. So that's included for us here. So I'm just going to. Uh, in is a, a variable for our script project. So uh, let's just get it back. Uh, I can paste code later on. So um, the next thing we need is um, a secret. So this will allow us to write um, data to um, our database uh, from app script. So in Remain's example, we actually um, allowed uh, to set the, the database to a, an open write mode. But um, I'm just going to show you where to get the secret because it's not entirely straightforward. So the secret is just a, an access key. To get this, you need to go into the cog um, on your project, go into project settings. And we need to go into service accounts. And you'll see in here, there is a database secret. <coughs> if I just click on show. So uh, my first question to remain is that this warning here, database secrets are currently deprecated. So um, how, how is that going to impact this flow in future? Uh, do, do you need to do an 
um, a no off flow or will these secrets always be available to use in your project? Uh, so it won't be an OS flow. Uh, in fact, uh, so these uh, those secrets are now uh, in a, a service accounts uh, part uh, of the uh, UI. Uh, and so you can uh, replace uh, these uh, simple secrets, uh, simple uh, string, not very l uh, long, uh, by a, uh, like a more complex uh, string. And so uh, if you create a new service account, uh, Google will uh, give you an email address specific to this uh, service account, uh, plus uh, I don't uh, uh, like a, a, a very more complex key uh, that you will also be able to uh, enter in the database uh, in the information uh, to to connect. Uh, the the thing is uh, at the moment uh, in uh, my documentation in the tutorial and so on we are uh, still uh, promoting the use of the old uh, secret keys. Uh, simply because they are a bit uh, faster to set up and yeah. also because uh, it won't, even if uh, Google has indicated that it's deprecated, it's uh, mainly because it's not as strong of, of a security uh, as the use of uh, real service accounts. Uh, for me, as uh, long as uh, uh, Firebase DB uh, exists like it is today. Uh, secrets will also exist like they exist today. Okay. Um, so uh, that I think good news. So, so given how easy it is to grab that, so and I've just pasted it in the code. So uh, the next bit is there. There is no uh, advanced service or service within App Script for um, Firebase. So we have to load the library for it. So as um, uh, Romain mentioned, this is something that they put to get, uh, he's put together with Spencer. So um, from uh, Romain's website, you'll get the, the ID for the, for the library. And we're just going to select the latest version. So what that then allows us to do, so um, we will have the, the autocomplete for Firebase. And you can see um, basically the first thing to do is to to get the, the database by URL. Um, so the URL we can we just set up as a variable, and the secret we set up as a variable. So I'm just going to set this as a variable. E equals. We've got, now got uh, the the set of functions that we can use. Um, now that we've got access to the database, is I'm just going to drop in some pre-prepared data. Uh, in Remain's example, we just pulled out um, some spreadsheet data. So this can be, you know, a form submit wherever you want. So in terms of setting the data, this is really straightforward. So um, we can just drop in this line. So um, we're calling this set data. The first um, variable is a is a path, um, so if you want to specify a path in the in the data, you can, and then you can just send in the data. So if I run this, we'll get prompted by our new authentication flow. So it's going to ask me to select the account, and because we're um, the Firebase app, will be using URL fetch. We're connecting to an external service. So this is running away, and then drop this in. So when we go into the database, uh, we can see that it's put all the countries in. So it's basically dropped those objects in. And it's quite nice the fact that we've got uh, a browser here um, to look at the data. So we can uh, see the structure of the data. We can see the data is in there correctly. Uh, so we're using a uh, a set data command there. There's another command just to highlight called push data. So um, this caused a bit of um, issues for me when I was uh, learning this this morning because I was trying to push data in. 
So if we run this, what push data does is actually uh, put the data in and generate uh, an automatic key for this. So um, this could be useful in other situations where you, you want to have, uh, you know, storage and you want a random key uh, assigned to it. You can see the data is actually um, structured within that key. Um, with the push data command, you'll, you'll basically get that key back so you could uh, store it as a variable. Uh, there's another option within uh, setting data to actually uh, um, update the data. There's um, an update data command as well if you want to just um, update part of a record. Um, so in this case, I'm going to change the fact that the uh, England region, which was set to Europe, uh, uh, given what's happening currently, uh, we're going to change it to, to UK. So again, when I jump back into the database, we can see this is now set to UK. So it's all very straightforward. The last bit is uh, a bit more uh, setup required. So now we say you've got a ton of data in your database and you want to query back uh, a certain part of it. So there's a couple of steps that you need to do. So the first step is um, you need to tell uh, Firebase what you're going to index the data on. So within the rules, uh, when you look at uh, Remain's example, you, it shows you how you can use these rules um, for setting up different write access um, and read access. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to say index. So uh, the thing that was foxing me this morning was the, the dots are important. Um, so it doesn't give the most um, meaningful error message. So uh, if you haven't got the dot, you're going to be in problems. Uh, so that rule is now published. And what that means is we can now uh, query the data based on uh, some of the object properties. What I'm going to do is query the data um, on when uh, the region is equal to North America. Um, so if I just run that, and if I go into the logs, um, so we can see in here, it's pulled back the two records where it's North America. So this is my next question for you, Romain. So my understanding was that it's quite limited in terms of how you can query. So to specify that we're querying uh, records equal to North America, we have to specify order by is the region. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, every time uh, you uh, want to do a, a, a query uh, to try to get a, 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 a specific uh, uh, key value pair. Uh, you you need to have uh, at least uh, two uh, two parameters uh, in your query. Uh, so in this example, for example, uh, yeah, order by and equal to. Uh, I haven't uh, sorry, uh, I haven't followed it. In this case, it, it did work or not? Yep. So it, it, okay. it pulled pulled back just so there was a. If I just comment out that one, so. Uh, just to make it a bit easier to see. So it, it pulled back. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the the query part of uh, Firebase is uh, uh, pretty uh, limited, uh, especially when you uh, you start to have a, a very big database. Uh, because if you have a very big database, uh, it's uh, it, it it will take too much time to uh, actually uh, run a query uh, across a, a large part of your database. Um, so, uh, in my experience, uh, but uh, 
again, it's uh, mostly because uh, we are uh, we have big uh, Firebase databases uh, for uh, user emails, for example. Uh, the database is more than uh, 1.7 uh, gigabytes, so it's kind of a big JSON. Uh, and uh, uh, on this database, I can't really use uh, queries. Uh, so uh, instead, uh, I uh, used um, uh, what is, um, uh, sorry, I for, uh, I'm denormalizing the data, uh, meaning that, uh, for example, uh, I will have uh, uh, part of my DB with uh, all the countries and another part of the DB uh, with uh, all the regions. Uh, and so if I want to uh, get information uh, on the uh, specific uh, region, I will directly uh, look uh, at the information in the region pass and uh, not uh, in the uh, country parts of the DB. I would just, <laughs> just, what, just, just, just to add to what, what Romain said, um, the thing about Firebase, it's not like a regular database where you, where the main way to access it is via queries. The main way to access it is via a path. So in, in, if you look back at your example where you had uh, regions and all the rest of it. The path that you would look at would be as far down as you could go to partition the data into a small amount. So it's a little bit different than that. And that's why I know that you, those of us that are used to databases are used to normalizing databases where you get rid of duplication and all of that you can, um, you know, you've got lots of links and so on and so forth. The Firebase is not like that. You have duplication so that you can. Um, order things in the way that you're likely want to want to be able to access it. But having said all of that, if you do that, it's very, very fast. If you do queries where it's got to look at the whole thing, it's kind of slow. And uh, when I need to uh, really analyze uh, all the data in the database, I actually uh, do a backup. Uh, so I download uh, a very big JSON file uh, and I do my queries uh, on this uh, local copy uh, of the DB uh, rather than uh, uh, actually uh, on the uh, real uh, uh, Firebase DB uh, because uh, if I was doing uh, the queries I'm doing uh, in this specific case, uh, the database would uh, go down for a while for uh, all the other users and that's that's something I want to happen. To happen. I'll just conclude by saying, so the quote is on the free, so you, you allowed uh, 100 simultaneous connections, you allowed a gig of storage and 10 gigabyte a month uh, on the database. So there's lots potentially to play with. This is probably the <laughs> opportune point to um, has to remain your fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Locked and I did. <laughs> uh, so, um, as we introduced a bit Firebase, I just wanted to uh, mention how I'm using it and uh, why I'm uh, using it uh, uh, mostly in my uh, add on uh, yet another main merge. Uh, so, uh, first, I'm using it as a kind of uh, replacement of uh, script DB uh, to save information about uh, each uh, user. So I have uh, all my uh, users' profiles uh, in Firebase, but uh, you could uh, use other databases uh, than Firebase for that. Uh, why I decided to uh, go uh, with Firebase is uh, mostly because of the uh, real-time uh, capabilities of the database. And uh, I'm going to show you this uh, with uh, Yetron the Mail Merge uh, right now. Uh, so just one second. Yay. Uh, so is everyone able to see my screen? Yeah. OK, so here in Gmail, uh, I have uh, uh, 
little uh, draft that I will uh, use in uh, use the mail manager. And uh, for this uh, campaign, I choose to uh, email uh, all the uh, people uh, working on the team here. Uh, so I will uh, all uh, send you an email and uh, uh, we should be able to see in uh, real time if you are opening the email, answering it, and so on. Uh, so, uh, first, uh, you know, the mail manager is a uh, mail manager tool uh, that can send a lot of uh, emails. And I wanted uh, people to know exactly what was happening uh, on server side uh, from the UI. And uh, for that, I didn't want to uh, do uh, back and forth between uh, the client and the server every time an email was sent, but I wanted still to tell people when an email was sent. So uh, from the server side in app scripts, every time a new email is sent, uh, it, uh, uh, it updates a specific uh, number uh, in Firebase uh, and uh, the uh, client side uh, part uh, of the add-on uh, is uh, watching uh, this part of the DB. And so every time the number is incremented uh, by the server uh, without uh, having uh, to return anything from a script to the client and uh, 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 stop the script from running, um, uh, Firebase uh, will let the client side uh, know uh, that the email has been, opened, uh, has been sent. So if I click on send email, uh, you can see a little uh, progress bar and every time a new email will be sent, I can see in real time uh, that they are being sent. Uh, so here are uh, the five email sent. Uh, and after that, we have a little sidebar here and I can see that Steve has opened and then clicked the email. And uh, if uh, uh, Martin and Bruce uh, want to try it, uh, they should also be able to uh, find the email in their mailbox, uh, maybe click or uh, open and unsubscribe or uh, answer to the email or whatever. Uh, the thing is, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, sidebar here uh, is updated in a real time uh, thanks to uh, Firebase. So every time someone opens an email, uh, we record an information in Firebase and as the uh, client side uh, of the app of uh, different domain merge uh, is uh, uh, using Firebase uh, in real time, uh, we get the info. And then I use uh, a simple uh, Google scripts run commands uh, to update also the info in the spreadsheets. That's all. And that really is a wow factor for me because you're updating the database and then based on some odd event on the client side, it's bang, it's there. I just think that's, I don't know if there's any other tools or methods that they can actually do that. Uh, good question. I suppose there are, uh, but yeah, Firebase was uh, really easy to implement. And while it has the additional benefit of uh, being uh, part of uh, the uh, Google ecosystem, uh, meaning that uh, all uh, the data are stored uh, on Google servers. Uh, I only pay one bill uh, and uh, well, uh, I everything is connected to the same uh, cloud console project and so on. Uh, so for me, it was a real benefit. Bruce, did, uh, did you want to come in with anything on that? Um, I just wanted to say that the way that you you generally interact with Firebase is interesting as well, because you um, because it's a real time database, um, it's driven by by events. So in other words, if anybody updates, there's a kind of a copy of the database kept in your client. So if anything update gets updated on the regular one, it synchronizes to your client and then calls back a function in your um, in your app, which then is able to. Um, react to a change that's being made. So, in fact, you're being told about changes that get made to the database. You're not actually going to check. So, it's kind of a push notification is what's happening. It's a really, really good. Uh, it's really nicely done. Actually. 
Yeah, it's actually uh, using the web sockets. Uh, and uh, yes, it's uh, way better than uh, having to uh, pull uh, data every uh, seconds or whatever. Uh, yeah. Well, great example. Um, we've, uh, we've actually got a bit of time left. So uh, Bruce, do you, you, you've also got a, another example of using Firebase with hey, some actually, frameworks. Actually, yeah, give me a second till I just get there. Um, I don't know where it is right now. There we go. Uh, so well, while you do that, I have one other question for uh, Um Can you uh, monitor more than one click in your email messages, or is it limited to one click events? Uh, no, no, we could uh, monitor. Uh, well, this uh, this is not exactly uh, related to app script. Uh, so we, well, no, because we couldn't make a redirect. We could use cloud functions for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, w w what I'm doing is uh, simply, uh, uh, so when you create your uh, draft in Gmail, and then you uh, use YAM to send the email. I will get the draft, uh, find the links, uh, find the URL in the in this draft, uh, replace the, those URLs uh, by a, a specific uh, URL of a uh, web service that I own. Uh, and so uh, when uh, I will send the email, uh, then uh, when, I, uh, when the recipient will save it, open it, and click on the link, it will go through my server first. I will record the fact that he has opened the email, uh, and then I will redirect him to the original internet URL. Uh, and as I can add uh, different parameters uh, in the URL, uh, I can track uh, who has opened the email, uh, to which com campaign it is linked, uh, what uh, to which URL to be rejected and so on, and uh, uh, I can handle uh, as many URLs as you want. Uh, in fact, uh, we've seen uh, weird emails uh, being sent with YAM, yet uh, and uh, uh, some people are like more than uh, have more than like a uh, hundred links in their emails. I don't know the uh, the purpose of that, but whatever, we're handling that. Okay, well, thank you. Because I know usually when you send an email, you want like one call to action instead of 100. But all right, thank you. <laughs> uh, back to Bruce, I guess. I, I just got a question. So Jacob is on the YouTube chat. And so uh, he was wondering if there was more you could say about how the Firebase um, updates the client side. Um, without the client side actually querying for updates. Yeah, uh, so okay. this is uh, not related to app script. Uh, you need to use the uh, official and very standard uh, uh, JavaScript SDK uh, client side uh, of, uh, of Firebase. And uh, if you go through the uh, documentation, uh, the official Firebase documentation, uh, you will see that uh, you can uh, uh, create a specific listener uh, uh, on listener to uh, be notified every time the, a specific uh, value or a specific uh, part of your DB, a specific pass of your DB uh, is receiving an update. Uh, if a new child is added, added as a specific uh, uh, um, pass uh, in the DB uh, or removed or updated, uh, there are many many different uh way to uh, watch information and uh, it's uh, very easy to uh, to activate uh, on the client side uh, another great example of how html service is enabling yeah uh, the app script community to do you know with a lot of existing javascript client libraries out there um so hopefully that answers your question I just want to talk a little bit about Firebase authentication because that provides, a, 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 in my opinion, a very simplified um, OAuth type flow. 
Um, again, it uses the JavaScript client, so you're running on the uh, HTML service, whether it's a, an add-on or something, something like that. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about React, Redux, and Material UI. I mean, they're not app script things, but if you're writing HTML service things, then you're probably going to be using some kind of framework. Um, some people use Polymer. Some people use also Angular. Some people use all sorts of things. Um, I find that React, which is a little bit like Polymer, is pretty good. Uh, and Redux is a way to um, uh, formalize your communication between your HTML objects and your backend data store. So it avoids the problem of asynchronously updating the same thing from multiple places. So um, I'm not going to go into those things too much. I just want to talk about Firebase authentication. But I had to mention that so we could, we could set the scene. So um, if we move on to the next slide, let's see. So uh, one of the things that uh, Firebase does for you is to keep a list of all your users and their email addresses, which means you don't have to, um, which is pretty cool. So it means that you can set up a, a, a system that has got registered users for whom you don't ever have to care about their email addresses. You never have to store it because Firebase does. And in fact, what you do is you, you, you this is the same console that Martin was showing earlier, except it's the authentication part of it. So this is a list of users that's, that's subscribed to, to one of my apps. And um, I refer to them by the user, user UID, not by their email. I never look at their email. So that's a good place to, to, to start and a good place to be. Um, and if you want to enrich that data, which, which, which I do, um, you can use the Firebase internal ID for someone to then store stuff against in a separate Firebase database um, against that Firebase UID. So again, you don't have to keep uh, email addresses in your own database or, or, or anywhere else, which is which is pretty cool. So how does all that work? Um, first of all, just before we look at the code, I'm going to just flip over to uh, an app that's using it. So actually, what this is, it's a um, it's a cross-platform cache. Um, and it kind of does some of the things that Firebase does, actually, that we we're talking about earlier. It does have push notification um, of changes, but it also ha it's also got the ability to push notify app script through um, sending a post message to it. So although you can do the same thing in terms of waking people up, waking an app up that's running the JavaScript client, you can also wake app script up by sending a post message to it. So it's, it's supposed to be a cache that can be used by any platform, essentially. Um, but I do use Firebase with it a little bit, and I use it for authentication uh, and for keeping track of registered users. So to sign in, you can see up at the top, I'm signed in. I've signed in using Firebase. And um, if I want to sign out, I just do that, and I'm gone. And if I want to sign back in again, and I just do that, it brings up the Firebase authentication. If it didn't know me, it would ask for the usual stuff there about do you want to allow this thing to happen? But it knew me, so therefore it allowed me, and that's signed in. So that's all there is to it. And this is running React and Redux behind the scene. So we go back now to the, the slides. And we'll take a little look at the code. It, this won't make a tremendous amount of sense if you don't know um, React. But I just wanted to show how um, straightforward it is to use the authentication API, although it won't look that way if, you, if you're not familiar with this kind of approach. Um, so really, the, the, the way things work within React is that it's a kind of a mixture of HTML and JavaScript in the same uh, place. So it's exactly the opposite of what we're used to doing, which is to separate HTML and JavaScript. This mixes them up. And in fact, you create components, which you can then reuse throughout your application in various places. So the, the, the render. Um, function the random method here is what creates the thing that gets displayed on the page. And in fact, in my case, it's not what, what gets displayed in the page, but what gets displayed in that little chip, which was the pic, my picture plus my name. So this is the uh, the function that does that, and we'll take a look at uh, what happens if we're logged in, and we know that from Firebase is keeping track of it. Um, then that means that we're trying to log out. So therefore, I set up a chip. And, and you can see in the bottom what a logged in chip looks like, which is then going to um, to, to log us out. And then if I'm not 
logged in, I need to create a, a, a signed in chip, which is what we have here. So I'm not going into this code at all, um, but I'm going to just quickly go to what sign in and sign up does. Um, we have to use Redux at this point. And as I said earlier, Redux is a thing that controls access to a central store of all the data in your app. So all you do when you want to do something with Redux is you dispatch a, a function to it. That takes care of it and then puts the answer in a central place you can access later on. So that's the simple sign, out and, sign in and sign out. And I'll get to the Firebase bit now. And you can see that this is all there is to it, apart from a little bit of setup, um, to do that entire authentication process. First thing you need to do is to set up the provider. Now, Firebase has multiple providers. It's not just using Google. You can also log in using um, Facebook or uh, uh, GitHub and various other providers as well. Um, I happen to want to use the Google provider, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, and then once I've set that up, I simply call sign in with pop up, which then goes ahead and works through the mechanism of finding out if someone has already logged in. If they haven't, then I'll ask them their username and password and so on. Um, and then that's it. This is this is where the cool part comes in because I think we mentioned earlier that you listen for things in Firebase rather than check for things. So so to determine whether or not someone has actually gone through the process of logging in, you set up this callback here and you listen for it. And if the auth state changes, which means that the guy has gone from being uh, logged into not logged in or vice versa, then it calls me. And I can just call my function uh, that processes someone having logged in, which was what we looked at earlier to change the little avatar and so on, um, passing to the user who had just logged in. And the cool thing is that Firebase passes also um, its user ID and anything else that I'm storing about it as well. So I think that could well be all I have. Yep, that's it. Uh, I didn't want to get into the code too much because, as I say, we could have been here for a long time. But in principle, it's just being able to um, use Firebase not only to handle the auth login, but to take care of calling you back when there's something interesting to do. And the other part that's quite good is that you, you, you can see now that you're able to use Firebase across pretty much any platform that can speak JavaScript. And that's pretty much it. It's a really nice example. I, I wasn't aware of um, the, the often you, you I'm, I'm learning a lot today. I wasn't aware of the <laughs> authentication aspect yes it's an Firebase. entirely it's an entirely um it's a it's, it's an easier way of doing OAuth if you like it's not really it's not really the same flow but it's an easier way of doing it than what you've been used to um through um the regular google OAuth uh, flow so with um some of the calls you were doing there and i noticed you were, you, you were creating a new firebase instance so are you using the the Firebase client library within. Yes, it. yeah, that, that's all stuff out of the client library. Yeah. Impressive stuff. Well, we, I think we have, we, we owe Bruce, <laughs> given all his contributions, a, a dedicated show on um, a purely exchange. Um, so we should work on that one. Uh, unfortunately, it wouldn't be our next show, which we have a date for. And fingers crossed, we'll run technically smoother so uh, our rescheduled show with real and romaine is on the 9th of june starting at the same time um so we hope you'll be able to join us for that so fingers crossed everything goes more smoothly next time and we hope you can join us uh, thank you to contributions from steve romaine and bruce and we'll see you on the other side thank you guys thank you Bye. I'm going